ask you yourself, introduce yourself. Sure, um, sure. Yeah, it's it's really my pleasure to be here. Um, so, you know, as it says on the on the box here, um, I'm going to be talking about devices, privacy and trust in Amazon. And I will introduce myself in just a moment um, formally. Um, but I mean, first, let me just quickly go over what I'm going to talk about today. So, you know, surprise, surprise, I'm going to introduce myself. As I said, I'm going to talk about who I am. It's kind of important that you know who I am as opposed to just some random talking head on the video because you really have no reason to trust what I'm saying at all. So I'm hoping that, you know, after going over that a little bit, you'll have at least some measure of confidence that I know what the heck I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and then after I introduce myself, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what I do. Um, and then after I go into that a bit, I'll kind of expose kind of the broader context of, you know, privacy. I'm also going to touch on security. I know this is a privacy engineering class, but privacy and security go hand in hand. Uh, I will talk a bit about the distinction between the two, both like philosophically and also from kind of like an Amazon standpoint. Um, but I'm going to talk about the context of privacy, security and trust, which is very important um, at Amazon. Uh, then I'm going to go a little bit into what I see as challenges for privacy engineers. So, you know, for some folks in the audience, this is going to be kind of like a fast forward to, you know, the career that might lie ahead of you. Um, for those of you who are involved in more research, this is going to talk about like open research challenges. Um, but then after that, I'm going to describe a little bit about what I've done to solve some of these problems, or at least put a dent in them, uh, and what I learned as a result. And I'll, I'll say as well that, um, you know, a lot of that work um, was stuff that I did during my PhD, which, you know, we'll talk about right now. So who am I? Uh, well, my name's Daniel Smolin. Um, and, you know, in recent history, um, I was uh, in the PhD program and uh, postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, that's out in Pittsburgh. Um, and now I'm at Amazon Lab 126. And I'll explain what that is in just a little bit. But, you know, from my perspective, you know, my about me is how you know, how I see myself, I'm a generalist. So, you know, I, I do focus on privacy, but I also bring a lot of other knowledge areas. Um, you know, software engineering is what it says on all of my degrees that I have on my wall. Um, but, you know, I do privacy, I do security, I do usability, I do a bunch of stuff. And I like to tackle problems that push me outside my comfort zone. I think that's really important um, sort of in life generally. Um, you know, you wanna be able to go outside your comfort zone. Um, and what I do for work is I solve socio-technical problems and I use interdisciplinary research methods. So that's a really fancy way of saying that, you know, I don't just do computer science stuff. I also bring in knowledge from, you know, behavioral economics and psychology and all these other things which are relevant because privacy is an interdisciplinary area. Um, and so fundamentally, my goal, my personal goal is to help the world develop more usable, secure, privacy preserving and trustworthy software. Um, now, before I get into the actual meat of the talk, I have to give sort of a standard disclaimer. This is kind of important um, out there in the corporate world. Um, so all the opinions and views that I'm gonna express in this talk, which is recorded, they're mine and, and mine alone. They don't represent that of Amazon or anybody else, it's just me. Um, and so I'm gonna give you the benefit of my background, my expertise and my experience, but I'm not gonna reveal anything that's privileged, confidential, or really anything that's Amazon related that you can't find out there in the public. You know, everything that I mentioned that's about Amazon is something that there's been a press release about or that's in the news. Um, and and I'm, I'm gonna have to, you know, be very strict about cutting it there. So, you know, I apologize in advance if there's questions that I can't answer, but I'll try my best. Um, and I'll head off one of the questions that I always get first before we even get there. And that is that my Alexa wake word um, is the word that you see here that I'm not going to say out loud um, because I like to pretend that I'm on the USS Enterprise. Um, so let's dive a bit deeper into what I actually do. So I'm an applied scientist um, and I work for, you know, part of Amazon called Devices, Privacy and Trust, which is under Amazon Lab 126. Um, so I have a really broad scope. Amazon devices, um, there's dozens of them. I mean, there's a few examples that you see here, but there's there's many more that I'll list later. That means hundreds and hundreds of product teams. That means thousands and thousands of builders. And builders include everything from, you know, software development engineers, which is Amazonian parlance for like folks that write code, to managers, to technical project managers, to uh, product managers, um, lawyers, and and more and more and more. Um, and, and so in general, the way that I describe myself in Amazon is as a trusted advisor. So people come to me, 
when they're trying to do sort of high stakes decision making. Um, the stakes can be very, very high at Amazon, which is, you know, like a trillion dollar company. Um, and the, the main goal professionally is to help avoid trust busters, um, which I think is hopefully self-explanatory, uh, but in general to maintain trust with Amazon's customers. That's really critical. Um, you know, there's this Amazon leadership principle of customer obsession, and that's really part of what that's all about. And then in terms of like actual practical things that I do, I do a lot of analysis and a lot of auditing. Um, so I analyze software architectures, but I also, you know, because devices is, is in the name here, um, do a lot of analysis of, of embedded systems and, you know, software systems, Internet of Things stuff. Um, I also do a lot of requirements engineering work. Um, and uh, I also do a lot of usability and design analysis and, and auditing as well. Um, now, because I work in the privacy space, there's always sort of a relationship with, you know, the law. Um, but I'll say up front, I'm not a lawyer. I just kind of play one on TV, um, you know, <laughs> uh, and I, I again, I, I have software engineering expertise, but I'm, I'm not a software engineer per se or a software development engineer in Amazonian parlance. Um, so I don't write a lot of code, but when I do write code, it, it really counts. Um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of thought um, and, and uh, you know, careful planning uh, that goes into any time that I do actually sit down and write some code. So then what's the broader context, right? Where do I actually sit within this like mega corporation of Amazon? So for those who don't know, Amazon's kind of divided into three chunks. There's Amazon Web Services, AWS, and this is a completely separate business. They have a separate customer base. They have separate services. They even have separate leadership. They all report to the same CEO and board of directors as, you know, like Amazon Corporation, um, but they're, they're a separate entity. Then you've got this kind of middle piece, which is cross-organizational functions. So there's, you know, cross-organizational legal teams, finance teams, human resources teams, pub public relations and communications teams. I mean, this is important because these are all folks that, you know, you engage with um, when you are involved in privacy. And that probably shouldn't come as a surprise because, well, obviously lawyers have a lot to do with the law and privacy, um, but finance, human resources, PR and communications, all of these other folks are subject to privacy regulations as well. And they are also dealing with data. And, you know, that's kind of important when you're working on privacy problems. Now, the third chunk is the sort of everything else. Um, and it might seem kind of funny to have such a massive bucket because, you know, this includes everything from amazon.com um, you know, the website and the e-commerce platform to, you know, Amazon devices slash lab 126, which is highlighted in red because that's where I sit. But there's also media and advertising. Um, IMDB is an Amazon product. You know, there's, a, there's a ton of stuff in there in this sort of everything else bucket. But in, in terms of lab 126, we deal with devices. So what are some examples? Well, I listed some earlier, not just Alexa enabled devices, but actually Alexa itself, um, Fire TV, Ring, so like the camera and camera enabled systems and so on, every system that goes along with it, not just the hardware. Halo, so like, you know, your smart watches and health tracking systems. Uh, Kindle, which is awesome. I recently bought a Kindle Paperwhite and I'll never go back. Um, but then there's also books, right, which is the actual like you know, e-commerce platform for books. There's the Astro Robot, which I recently got to see a demo of when I was in Sunnyvale recently, and it's pretty cool. Um, then there's also stuff like Moonshots, such as Project Kuiper, um, which is, you know, a massive worldwide satellite communications network. So that's also under my purview. And then a whole pile of other cool stuff that I can't tell you about yet. Wish I could, but sorry. Um, so then within... Lab 126, I sit on a specific team that's called Digital Privacy. Um, and so all of my team and everybody else in devices reports up to the senior vice president, Dave Lemp, who's got a very nice inspirational quote here about privacy that you can read. Um, but in terms of my team, well, it, it's what it says in the box here. This is actually taken from, from um, sort of our, uh, our, our documentation and, and materials. And, you know, we're part of the devices and services, trust and privacy group. So what it sort of says in the box. And we drive the overall consumer privacy program. Um, so the key mission for, for my team is to build and deepen the trust that customers have in Amazon. That's really what this is all about. Um, so, you know, we're committed to providing guidance 
and building mechanisms, which is like Amazon parlance for, you know, like stuff that allows you to do things in general. It's not like necessarily a physical mechanism. It could be an organizational thing. It could be a software thing. It could be many of those things. Um, and we're committed to, to building these mechanisms that enable devices and services teams. So like folks that, you know, work on all those devices that I talked about um, to deliver experiences that build and deepen trust with customers. Seems pretty simple. So then what I actually do in order to, you know, fulfill that objective is this list, right? So I'll provide, you know, practical guidance for building privacy into hardware and software development processes. So this is really important, right? All those, you know, courses that people often take in software engineering or computer science degrees that talk about like development life cycles and things like that. You know, it turns out that even though those lessons might seem superficially kind of boring and pointless, they're actually really, really important. <laughs> And going beyond that, I also help people understand the rules and policies that devices and services need to comply with. So whether this is related to data practices or other, you know, legally kind of stuff, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV and that's kind of how I do that. I also provide guidance for data collection best practices on devices. So like what you should or shouldn't, can or can't do. Um, and then I also help organizations build up privacy expertise and staff, right? Because we've got to figure out where to actually place privacy experts because there aren't that many of them out there in the world. So we have to be very careful about how we use that sort of scarce resource. Um, and then beyond that, the kind of bread and butter work, I determine privacy risks for projects and help mitigate them. I help teams on board to compliance tools that we develop internally. Um, I help teams and leaders understand how to think about privacy uh, as they design their products and services. That's really important because often business leaders have very little background in privacy. Now, we're, I'm very fortunate where I sit, where the leadership that I report up to has extensive privacy expertise, um, and that makes my job a lot easier, um, but not everybody does. So that's kind of important to make sure that everyone's on a level playing field and they understand what I'm talking about when I go deep into some of the theoretical aspects that I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. Um, and then I also help teams understand, you know, special ob obligations, especially those that are related to, you know, devices, right? Devices are mobile. Devices can be connected to the Internet of Things. They have a sort of special context that they live in that isn't the same as, you know, things like what's happening on Amazon.com, for example. Um, and then I also do things like help teams understand, you know, whether or how their data practices are subject to controls. So that doesn't necessarily mean like policies or rules or things like that. It may mean like actual mechanisms that you know make sure that privacy enhancing technologies are incorporated into things or you know that that data is aggregated in a certain way or that it's de-identified in a certain way and so on uh, and then also you know offer answers to general privacy questions and provide privacy training on on fundamentals um, now i'm about to reveal something uh you know when it comes down to life in the actual corporate world um many of you are going to probably you know, learn this insider information sooner rather than later, but many of you won't. What you actually do day to day, even though you aspire to do all of those things that I just mentioned is kind of as follows, right? You heard a lot of cats, you sit in a lot of meetings, uh, at Amazon in particular, you write a lot of docs. That's a very uniquely Amazon thing that people are not used to typically when they get started at Amazon. So like PowerPoint presentations are not the norm at all. And they're quite rare, in fact. A lot of times we'll sit down, we'll have entire hour-long meetings where we spend half the meeting time literally just reading a doc that we've spent a lot of time very carefully putting together. Um, and then, you know, of course, as anyone else does, I get excited and yell about things, you know, hopefully not at people, but sometimes with people. Drink gallons of coffee, uh, kind of essential, especially when you're giving talks at 8 a.m., um, and then, you know, I try to figure out what the acronyms people use stand for, which is often confusing, um, YMMV. And, you know, I also do science things that sound smart because I'm a scientist. So that's sort of part of the job description. So, you know, don't share this insider secret information with anyone. It's obviously super duper ultra top secret, um, you know, and uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> So let, let's get into the meat of the talk now. So what are the big challenges that um, companies and, and their customers face? And this is not Amazon specific. This is true no matter what area of not just the tech industry, but companies period face. Because everybody has data, everybody uses data, 
And whether you realize it or not, most companies are probably software companies these days, or at least deal in some respects with software and therefore data. So fundamentally, the big challenges are kind of in these four buckets. First, privacy is about personal choices, but that's really complicated, and we'll delve into that a bit more. Giving customers what they want is not easy. It's never, ever trivial. It's never, ever straightforward and obvious. Um, the third is that we need to actually help people, customers, but also sometimes people that work at companies, get what they want and prevent them from unexpectedly getting things they didn't want. So that's really central to that whole trust thing, right? Like people aren't going to trust you if you surprise them in ways that they don't like. You can surprise them in ways that they do like, but that's also kind of challenging. Um, and then finally, the fourth bucket is that lawyers and engineers don't always speak the same language. In fact, it's quite rare that they do. Um, but, you know, that's kind of just the facts of life. These are the big challenges. And I don't think that the reality is that there are hard and fast solutions to any of these four challenges. Um, but we we can put dents in this problem. So I guess really we can talk a bit more about what I've done to solve some of these problems. And that's really where the science piece comes in. That's why I'm an applied scientist. Um, but that's also why I, you know, went through the PhD program and did a postdoc at, at Carnegie Mellon, because ultimately I needed to learn how to do science well. And what that means is doing research well. So what are the scientific problem areas that I'm trying to tackle? Well, I talked about the sort of four buckets that, you know, in general companies and customers face, but there's a specific problem area that I focused on during my kind of academic career. Um, and that's kind of this. So giving consent and configuring privacy and security settings, it's very burdensome, right? The, the literature is very clear. Nobody reads privacy policies unless you're like forced to as part of a class or something like that. Or, you know, if you're like a lawyer or just like a very odd person, because privacy policies are the worst. Um, and nobody wants to spend time fiddling with switches and knobs, right? Like nobody buys a cool new product just so you can play with the settings. Like nobody does that. That's not a thing. So wouldn't it be easier to just like not offer settings, right? Surely that would be a simpler, you know, proposition, right? It would be easier for me as the developer of a system or product, to just like not have to build any of that stuff in. And surely it would be easier for like, you know, someone who's buying my product to just like not have to configure anything, right? That would be wonderful. It'd be magical. But there's a huge problem with this kind of thinking. So, you know, study after study after study shows people have different privacy and security concerns, right? So what matters to you isn't going to matter to me and vice versa. And people have different risk tolerances. And I think also very important, it's important to recognize that people have different confidence in their ability to avoid or mitigate risks. So if you, you know, talk to your parents, for example, their chances are they're probably not as comfortable as you are with fiddling with the buttons and knobs. They don't really know what they do. They don't really know what it means. And you know, many of us also struggle with this as well, but there's variability there. And so what this means is that there's often no clearly optimal default that's going to satisfy everybody in every possible situation. So what this means is that when controls are needed, you got to offer them, right? But again, as I mentioned earlier, it's not always obvious what the right controls are. And it's not always obvious what controls are actually effective for people in addressing their concerns. So that's really the fundamental problem. But so now let's let's just back up for a second. And it might seem strange to you that I'm like introducing the definition of privacy and security now, but it's kind of important because we need to get into the specifics here a little bit, right? So when I'm talking about data privacy, I'm talking about specifically the power to determine when, how, and to what extent information is shared with others, okay? So in theory, what that means is that we want to allow people to choose what data practices right, are too intrusive and creepy and restrict them. Simple. But then there's this other side to that coin. We also want to enable as many different choices as possible because we want to maximize people's autonomy, right? We want to allow them to have that power of determination. Okay, so then data security is a little bit different here. And this is an extremely important distinction. That's about the power to mitigate specific risks to data confidentiality, availability, and integrity, okay? this It's this sort of CIA triangle that a lot of people in security talk about. And that's a totally, totally different problem. It's about allowing people to choose what practices are too risky and restrict them. But the literature 
in usability very clearly shows that when it comes to security problems, you shouldn't offer alternative options if there is a safe default, okay? So keep that in mind, right? With privacy, it's really rare that there's a default that'll suit everyone. But with security, sometimes there is, okay? So, so there's an underlying philosophy that kind of guides this, this mode of thinking. And, and the overall goal here is to empower people, but without worsening the paradox of choice. And I'm not going to go into super duper details about what this paradox of choice is. You know, you can, you can read the, um, the actual citation that I have down here if you want to learn about it a little bit more, if, you, if you're not familiar. But essentially what it boils down to is that, you know, if you've got too many choices, you're not going to choose well. Right, that's kind of what it what it comes down to, and so that's that's kind of uh, something that's associated with this philosophy of libertarianism. I'm not talking about the political party; that's a completely different beast. I'm talking about a philosophical sort of you know concept, and so the traditional libertarian philosophy is about just giving people lots and lots of choices, and they'll hopefully be smart enough to empower themselves with those choices. And lots of businesses seem to be adopting this philosophy, but there's a question that I urge people to ask themselves, and that is, is that actually working, right? I'm not sure. And so what we found over the recent years is that one size fits all settings are just not considered acceptable anymore. And so what this results in with this libertarian philosophy is placing the responsibility on users to figure things out themselves. So what I'm advocating for here is an approach that's based on something called libertarian paternalism. And this paternalistic aspect, which means about sort of, you know, giving the guiding trust and, and sort of guiding hand, gentle, you know, nudge of a parent, paternalist, right, allows people to get the choices that they want, but we're going to help them get to the ones that they want. So in other words, what can we do to actually prevent our customers from feeling like we're railroading them into decisions that they might later regret? It's really it comes down to that. And then also to do that, can we capture people's preferences, whether it's stopped in, out, or otherwise address their privacy concerns without losing their attention and without losing their trust? And the answer is yes. But again, and I'm gonna get on my soapbox here. This is important for everyone here. It doesn't matter whether you're in the PhD program, master's, undergrad, privacy experts need to become usability experts. This is a, this is, a, a fact. I'm just going to state it out there. And you can agree or disagree, but I'm just going to state this is true. Because privacy and security mechanisms don't work if people can't or won't use them. They're useless. In fact, sometimes they're worse than useless. So companies are supposed to be ensuring that the customer gets the best possible experience. That's their goal. But sometimes the approach that they take isn't always perfect. And that's kind of a no-brainer. So it's, but it's tempting, right? It's tempting as system designers to just assume that we know what customers want. In fact, many customers get big and successful because they figured out what their customers want. But we need to always challenge these assumptions. Because again, this traditional libertarian philosophy that I described, it's everywhere. Companies, people in general, they just like to throw the spaghetti at, wall, at the wall and you know, hope something sticks, right? Hope eventually people figure out what choice it is that they want, what settings they want, whatever. But also what you're going to see out there in the business world is that there's this drive to get to an MVP, a minimum viable product, right now, and we can fix it later. But the question is when? The question is how? And the software engineering literature that's probably going to get hammered into your heads if it isn't already is that it's always better to fix problems in the design phase because it gets a lot more expensive later. Um, and then the other problem, of course, is that a lot of times as designers, we just mistakenly assume that it just works be just because we made logical or rational assumptions, right? They made sense at the time, but we need to actually test the assumptions. So that's kind of underpinning this very Amazonian leadership principle philosophy of working backwards from the customer. And so what I believe that means for privacy is to use empirical measurements to determine what the status quo actually is. So we got to ask some questions, right? How are customers interacting with the settings we provide? Do our customers have the same mental models that we do? And how can we close the gap between those two if they differ? So I'm going to go and give you an example of a successful usability analysis program. And this is kind of standard practice for what a privacy engineer might do in a company. And so what I did in this program is I asked the question, are the current settings working well enough? And what are some common shortcomings? And so to figure that out, I had to qualitatively study how a particular set of people interacted with the settings 
And in this case, the, the program was about browsers. So in their primary browser, the one that they use the most during contextual interviews. And I'll explain what that is in a sec. And then I, from there, tried to answer the question, how can we make the setting simpler? So to figure that out, I went to quantitative research methods. I crowdsourced and then quantitatively analyzed correlations among people's preferences to restrict certain data practices when they're browsing. So that, that allows me to answer this kind of fundamental question about browsers. And that is, do they provide adequate awareness and control about data practices? Because here's the thing, right? So people, when you're browsing, you're encountering risky or even intrusive data practices all the time. That's just a, a fact. And so it's not clear whether everyone's aware of these risks. Some people just are totally blind to them. And a lot of people have trouble understanding what the risks are because sometimes they're very technically involved. And a lot of people don't know what to do about them because they just can't figure out like what settings or browser or whatever they need to fix the problem. And it's not clear that the browsers themselves are actually offering people the settings that they need to address their concerns about this. So, you know, here's the actual formal research questions. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into them in too much detail because I think I kind of captured them at the 10,000 foot level. But when you're doing research, you always have to have formal research questions that you're actually answering because that's, you know, how you actually report on the success or failure of your research is your ability to answer these questions. But let's go back a bit and talk a bit about my methodology because I mentioned it was a contextual interview. And so you can kind of see in the background what that actually is. And so what, what you do during a contextual interview is you interview people, right? And I did it using Zoom and I had people actually interact with their primary browser, although I didn't have them do it directly because I didn't want people just like surfing the web arbitrarily. I needed them to be on a certain website and I needed them to not go through all the settings in the browser because obviously those not related to privacy or security or anything were sort of irrelevant, though I would allow people to do a little bit of exploration. We didn't have all day though, so we had to kind of keep things constrained. And I asked them questions about what they think is going on. It's really as simple as that, but there's an agenda, right? There's a script. And so the idea is I wanted them to identify whether different data practices were there on the website and to try to restrict them. Um, and then once I, you know, did all these interviews, I did some analysis, right? So I transcribed the interviews. I'd have to verify that the transcriptions aren't garbage and that there aren't like weird typos or, you know, weird like voice to text transcription errors. Then I had to actually analyze them and cross reference it with the video footage of the actual, you know, interview, right? See what people are clicking on, that kind of thing. And then I did something called thematic analysis, which basically in a nutshell is where you sit down with other researchers and you try to look at what was said in the transcript and put it into a bucket. And that's it, right? The bucket is going to make sense for the research question that you're answering. So that's a good place to start. So you're going to say, okay, well, you know, I think that this, you know, thing that this person said fits the theme of resignation. They seem like they're resigned or they seem like they're struggling or, you know, things like that. And you got to do this over and over and over and over and over until you don't see anything new. And then finally, you summarize, you wrap up, and then you write down what your findings were. But there's also some kind of important nuances here. I'll touch on these super quick. So again, you know, you had to make sure that everybody had the same experience during the interview. So everybody, no matter what browser they used, right, whether it was Chrome, Safari, whatever, they had to start on the same generic example website in the default out-of-box configuration for your browser, right? Because I didn't want their own settings to influence, you know, things because they might have made assumptions about how things are set up. So I had to tell them like, nope, it's a brand new browser, just set, just set up. It's the same website. Because also the thing is, I didn't want the website itself to influence their perception of what's actually going on, right? People feel differently depending on what the website is because they trust the website more or less, right? And so we used a real browser. That's important too. We didn't use like a mock-up because then it might not behave exactly the same as what the real browser would and that that reveals things even things like bugs in the browser right which we found um and then you know of course the website that we had them on had all the different data practices that i was studying because obviously you know you want you want the data practices to actually be there so that again the behavior of the browser and what's going on reflects real life now here's the tricky piece right you can't measure how people feel about websites and so on directly, right? You just can't do it. You can ask people questions like, you know, do you trust it, blah, 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 but that doesn't lead to easy measurements of what the settings do, right? So we've got to use proxy measurements, which means, you know, measurements that we can be confident in that closely associate with the thing that we're actually trying to measure, right? So 
two good examples of this, if we're trying to understand how people's awareness of what's going on and their control over what's going on, you know, is, is working, is accuracy and, and user burden, right? So accuracy is the accuracy of the settings that they have. So in other words, like what in what percentage of the overall scenarios, right? So for the number of different data practices and so on, do the settings actually allow people to get what they want, right? And then user burden is, well, how many settings do you actually have to configure in order to get there, right? Because that's going to differ depending on the browser. Some of them have one setting for like five different data practices, which might be good, might not be good. And some have like 50 settings for like three practices, right? And so what, this, again, this comes down to is about this whole customer trust phenomenon, right? So as I said, you just can't measure trust directly. Like if you come up to someone and you say, hey, do you trust me? Like they're going to be a little creeped out. That's not going to work. So the way that people signal their trust to you is things like giving you meaningful informed consent to allow things to take place and not restrict them right but in order for that to happen people need to actually understand what's supposed to be going on they need to see the benefit you've got to actually tell them that it's going to benefit them in some way and you have to be truthful and then people have to be assured that their concerns which you might not know ahead of time have actually been addressed sufficiently so if, if somebody understands the benefits and they see it and they get it but they're still not comfortable with what's going on. It's really simple. No means no, right? And there has to be a way for that to be expressed. This is just fundamental. Okay, so let's sum up, right? People have different appreciation of risks and benefits, even if they don't know all the technical details. That was something that was very clear in the study that we kind of you know, teased out. And this is something that I think is true in privacy generally. And what we also found is that there was relationships between people's preferences to opt out of things, but also the different types of practices that they encountered and also other things like the website and so on. Um, and so that's why we had to do things in our study to kind of control for that. So one thing is clear though, and that's that one size fits all settings can't satisfy everyone, right? It's like, you can't get like privacy, yes or no, because that what that means for you or versus me is gonna differ, right? Now, often it's the case that people want to opt out of things. But one big problem that exists out there is that people actually assume that there's always a setting to control everything that exists, but people just can't find them. And then that makes them super frustrated and that sucks. And then the other coin, uh, side of that coin is that people want to be notified about what's going on, right? They want to be told that certain data is being collected about them or that it's being used in certain ways, but they're super easily misled by what they see, especially when they're browsing privacy disclosures, like privacy policies. Nobody reads them for a reason, right? Because we're not lawyers. We can't just like read it and then be like, oh yes, you know, I understand that they're collecting data types A, B, C from me and using it for this purpose, but not this one. And if I click this button, it'll change that. I mean, like, that's impossible for people to understand intuitively. And even the best privacy policies that exist out there that are nice and simplified, they still don't really do a good enough job of fixing that problem. So what that results in is a misalignment between the control that people expect to have over what's going on and what they actually get. And again, that sucks, right? That leads to frustration. So one way to fix this is a strategy for standard settings, right? You'll note that I said that browsers have different settings. This is also true in many other contexts as well. But what we found and what we what you can say, you know, you can take away from this is that standardized settings can be more accurate and less burdensome. And I'll give you a clear example of that in another study that I did, which was related to Android smartphone permissions. So that I think we're all familiar with how these work, right? You can kind of see that on the right side of the screen, there's different permissions. They allow and deny different things. Different apps have these different permissions and you have to enable or disable them. The first time you're asked, or I should say that the app asks to use whatever functionality. And then there's other ones that you, you, know, you have to allow when you install the app, but that's kind of out of scope for the moment. Now, the, the idea here again, right, we're thinking that libertarian philosophy, well, why don't we just add more permissions, right? If there's things that people want to be able to allow or deny, let's let them, right? Let's just like add them in. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the problem is that when you add these extra permissions naively, you give people more choices, but to actually express those choices, people have to interact with those settings more, and that leads to higher burden. 
And the problem with that is nobody wants to just configure their settings all day. They want to actually use their devices. So study after study shows people really do care about their privacy and security, right? They, they're not not configuring their settings because they're lazy or because they don't care. It's because people won't meaningfully engage with the permission with the permissions. They won't, you know, their brain turns off if they're too burdensome and the acceptable threshold for people, the number of clicks, you know, the amount of brain power that they have to use before it just shuts off is very, very low, right? We've, we all know this when you're installing something on your computer, how many people just click next, 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 and they don't pay attention to what they're clicking on, right? That's normal. So the problem though, is that if you want people, if, if people want to get what they want, right? They need to be able to express their preferences more accurately. Remember what my definition of accuracy was earlier? And so there's this reconciliation, right? How do we reconcile the fact that preferences are complex, including being dependent on the purpose for allowing or denying the permission, right? Like, why do you need my calendar? Why do you need my contacts, right? But the number of settings is already way too high. People are already clicking like, yep, yep, allow, 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 whatever. So the question that of interest in my research is, can machine learning help mitigate this trade-off, right? Can we give people more settings, but can we make it easier for them to get configured? And I think the answer is yes, right? We use machine learning models to predict preferences, and we can figure out what these preferences ought to be and make these predictions by surveying them at scale. So the finer grain settings makes the configuration space bigger, right? There's more settings. But machine learning can make up for this, right? The heaviest burden can be taken up by the machine learning instead of just dumping it in the lap of the users and making them click everything. So how does this actually work? Well, we got to get people settings, right? We got a whole bunch of people settings. Yes, no, yes, no, for this, for that, for whatever, right? Then we cluster them together. So we use clustering methodologies. This I, I'm, I'm not going to go deep into the, how those machine learning methods work. This is an unsupervised machine learning technique. You know, I strongly encourage you to sign up for machine learning courses. They will benefit you, you know, like they are hard, but like, just do it. <laughs> and then each cluster has an associated set of recommended settings for permissions. We call these profiles or privacy profiles, right? So again, the methodology for this study kind of gets broken into three phases, right? We had to do the survey. We had to analyze the survey data, like what I just described, and then we build and analyze profiles, okay? So this is kind of what the survey looks like. It's really quite simple, but we had to collect a lot, a lot, a lot of preferences. In fact, in total, we crowdsourced almost 6,000 observations of preferences. So it took a few weeks to do this. We covered 108 apps. This was done in like 2019. So like it's fairly recent, but obviously apps change. This is the kind of thing that you'd probably have to do over and over and over again. Um, but we got nearly 1,000 Android users in the U.S. So this was, was a successful program. By the way, we didn't analyze every single, um, you know, uh permission out there we focused on only three um because we didn't we didn't have infinite resources for this but when we analyzed the survey data what we actually found because of course we also collected demographics about people um is that there's a ton of stuff that turns out is sig has a significant impact on what preferences people seem to express so obviously the purpose like why you know we're asking for the permission matters right but there's a ton of other things. So how familiar you are with it, how often you use the app, you know, what category belongs to in the Play Store, how old you are, what kind of education you have, all these things had an effect on what preferences people actually expressed. And that allows us to develop machine learning models on these, you know, different pieces of information to make better predictions. That's the whole point. Now, some people might naturally ask the question though, well, now hang on just a minute. Like, shouldn't I have to tell people what my marital status is for it to predict my preferences? And like, yes, you're, you're right. You know, like you don't actually need to collect that, but it's interesting from a scientific standpoint to understand the fact that this does actually seem to associate with a meaningful change in what kind of preferences people actually express, you know, what permissions they choose. Um, so then we build and analyze the profiles, right? And so the idea here is we wanted to kind of figure out based on the different parameters for the approach. And again, this is kind of machine learning, you know, details. So I won't go into too much of it. Um, but what we found essentially was that the parameters that you picked, and this K represents like how many people are put into a profile right, at minimum. So, you know, we start with like two people per profile and then go up to like 40 people per profile. Sorry, 
actually it's the it's the opposite how many profiles we have in general right so when, when it's two it means we divide up everybody into just two groups when it's 40 we divide up everybody into 40 groups right and so what we found is there's kind of a sweet spot right if you just lump everyone into two categories you're probably not going to be as good as if you're sort of in the 14-ish range but in general what we found is that the machine learning model that took into account the purpose for people choosing the permission versus the one where we didn't take that into account and we just had the normal android preferences that we were trying to make predictions about the normal one fared worse you had to click on more stuff to get to the settings that you want because the machine learning model wasn't able to accurately predict your preferences as often because the more accurate the machine learning model is the less you have to tell it like hey no 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 i don't want that setting i want this other one instead Okay, so here's a fancy science scatter plot where we actually plotted, you know, the number of user interactions versus the overall accuracy. And each one of these dots represents one of those buckets of how many buckets we actually put people into. into. And so you can kind of clearly see here, right? Higher is better because that means more accuracy, right? And, you know, obviously further to the left is better because that's fewer interactions necessary. And so in general, the purpose specific one, the one that has purpose built into it, it behaves better, right? There's some outliers on the top right. You can see that you can get higher accuracy, uh, you know, with the one that doesn't have purpose, but it also has massively more user interactions. So that's the thing, right? Is it realistic for people to provide that number of user interactions when they're configuring their settings? Probably not. And then when we compare this to the actual original Android permissions model, right? If you've got 36 apps, each one has three permissions because that's what we studied. And then you add to that model three purposes. That means that at minimum, you're going to have to have 324 interactions, right? You're going to have to click 324 times to configure the basic number of apps that you use every day. Nobody's going to do that. No one. Not a chance, right? So the idea here is that the machine learning, even with more complex permissions, right, the ones that have got purpose, can achieve higher accuracy. We can predict people's preferences better, but also have fewer user interactions overall. So that's great. That means mission accomplished. So let's recap a little bit here, and then I'll wrap up. So mobile app permissions, they're standard, actually, right? Remember earlier on, I said that it's you know something that would allow you to achieve lower burden and give people what they want more often. Well, that's true with mobile app permissions compared to say like browser privacy settings because those are all over the place but mobile app permissions are standardized but that's still not good enough as we saw right like people have to click hundreds of times never going to work and they but they don't even include purpose right and we know that people are probably going to allow or deny things differently if they know what they're allowing or denying it for you know some people want to allow things for advertising but some people don't right now, if we add that to the permissions model, it just explodes the number of settings. There's already too many, won't work. But if we add these factors and we use machine learning models to make predictions about what people are likely going to want to choose for their settings, and we help them configure, not configure it for them, we help them configure their settings, then we get more accurate recommendations and it reduces the number of user interactions. And then people are happier and they get the settings that they actually want. And so that higher accuracy and lower user burden means that that trade-off that seemed to exist, where just adding more permissions makes things worse, is actually mitigated and you make things better. So that's the point that I'm trying to get across here, right? When we think as a privacy expert and we think as a usability expert, we can make configuration easier and more consistent. And that means actually giving people the privacy that they want. So standardization is really key here. It helps people control their privacy and security settings in a more consistent way, but it also allows more diversity of preferences because we know fundamental to privacy is giving people the choices that they want, but not just dumping it on them. We need to help them get what they want. So if we simplify or consolidate the settings, it might not be enough to make the settings usable, right? You can't just, you know, take away the settings, give them one and say, yep, there's your privacy setting, turn it on or turn it off. That won't work. But we can mitigate the trade-off between accuracy and user burden if we give them more settings by using that machine learning to actually help configure them. So when we offer these more fine-grained and accurate settings, we don't necessarily have to just dump that burden on people directly either. The machine learning models can actually help. But again, the main sort of 
concept that you have to understand about why this works is not just because machine learning is like super smart and it's fancy and like, yeah, you know, it's machine learning, machine learning, blockchain technology, crypto, everything, right? Because that doesn't make any sense. The point here is that the settings are more aligned with people's mental models when we use the machine learning, because we make these predictions based on profiles that contain like-minded individuals, people with similar preferences. And that's the point. If the settings aren't aligned with how you think about what the settings do or the settings that you expect, then giving more settings is actually going to make the problem way, way worse. And that's the fundamental reason why the machine learning can actually help. So again, how does this like actually help customers? Well, when you offer simpler and more consolidated and more targeted decision prompts, do you want this or do you want that? Then we address people's concerns better. And this is based on like actual data, empirically observable trends, not just what we think people want, right? Because that's more likely to be in tune with what people's mental models actually are. And that reduces friction and it ensures that people don't just click, 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 click. Also, it helps reduce the cognitive burden. And that's the, that's the reason why people won't just click, 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 because you're meeting them at their level. And so recommendations to allow or deny things to help people configure their preferences are based on real data. They're trustworthy. So people don't think like, whoa, these guys have got me all wrong. They're recommending things that make no sense to me, right? No, 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 you're more accurate more often. And then that additional data, like I talked about, can also help people understand the recommendations. So if we say things like, hey, people in your age range tend to be like, you know, a little bit more likely to restrict access to their calendar, for example, people will be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So I guess maybe that recommendation to restrict my calendar for this app, you know, I guess I'll accept that. That sounds good. That's how you build trust. So for the researchers or those who are research, you know, curious in this room, these are the methodologies that kind of underlie what I do, right? There's user studies. So like the contextual interview is a good example of that because we want to try to probe what people know and what they don't know and to what extent they can actually take advantage of what we're giving them, right? Does it work? Does it not work? Do they understand? Do they not? Then from there, you can start to introduce quantitative methodologies. You can't just jump right into surveys. Surveys are really hard to get right. But once you've done the pre you know, the pre-work with user studies that are qualitative in nature, you can then build surveys. You can use those to identify more usable settings, and you can figure out how to strike the balance between accuracy and user burden. And then finally, there's the machine learning piece. And I think that's pretty clear. We want to simplify the management of the settings. We want to make recommendations. So let's just recap, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So essentially, I talked about those four buckets of problems that people and companies face out there. And so the reality is that privacy and also security settings, they're gonna continue to evolve, but they're also gonna to continue to proliferate. We really do need more settings. The ones that we have right now just aren't good enough, but it's not gonna be enough to just offer more of them. And so there's a few ways we can make them better, not just more plentiful. We can make them more manageable. We can better align them with how people think about you know, what they want, what they're getting. We can also make them more comprehensive and we can also make them more accurate. So I wanna just take a moment to point out though that regulations are also changing and companies are subject to regulations. And these are a forcing function to also normalize and standardize recommendations as well. And the research clearly bears out that, you know, standardized recommendations, standardized settings are helpful. It's easier for people to understand. And machine learning can make management even easier. I think I showed that. So fundamentally, what we can do as privacy engineers is we can empower people. We can empower people with awareness of what's going on and control by helping them configure their settings. That's it. That's the, that's the key to success here. We want to help people. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not really rocket science, although maybe sometimes it feels like it. So I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Uh, my contact information is here on the screen uh, now. You can email me anytime. Uh, and if you want to learn about some of my prior research and my prior life, you know, prior to Amazon, even prior to my PhD, you know, I worked at NASA JPL doing radar interferometry or, you know, all the stuff that I did on autonomous highway surveillance systems or de defense department stuff, all that stuff, go to my website. Um, but thank you very much for your attention.
Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, I think if you would like to ask me a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and just lay it on me. Um, and, you know, we'll try to maintain some order amidst the chaos. Hey, uh, so I have a question. I have a couple questions. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So my first question is about this use of ML to kind of make privacy preserve or help users create privacy preserving decisions. Yeah. Um, isn't there kind of a paradox there where you would first need to collect information about the user before you can implement those models? Like you are absolutely correct, but it's not a paradox because if you have people's consent to collect this information, then they are willingly and voluntarily giving it to you for that purpose. And that's the whole point. So if you tell people like, hey, we're collecting your preferences right now because we want to help you and other people configure their settings better, then people will be like, oh, hell yeah, I'm, I'm all for that, you know? For mm -hmm. the most part. And some people will want to opt out, and that's fine too. But what's the norm now? When was the last time when you were configuring your settings, you had something tell you, hey, by the way, we're actually going to be using your settings to help people figure out what to configure? Probably never. <laughs> so, yeah. And it, so, is it more like, do you have to collect different uh, personal information for, to use the machine learning models? Like, do you have to collect more demographic information about the user before implementing those kinds of well, things? Well, I'm glad that you use the term personal information because that doesn't just mean things like demographics. Your behaviors are considered personal information as well. And what settings you select are representative of your behaviors. So all of this is personal information. But like, yes, that's correct. Fundamentally, in order to train the machine learning model, you need to collect the information about what the decisions are that the machine learning is gonna help you make. So if that's for you know what your settings ought to be, then you have to collect settings, right? But mm -hmm. what I'm saying as well is that there's other side information that you can also collect, which can help you with those predictions as well, right? That you obviously can't substitute those for the settings themselves, right? Like you really do need the settings. That extra information can help you go the extra mile. However, only under the circumstances that it's actually going to help people. You can't just willy-nilly use this information because there's a good chance that people won't want you to use it for that purpose. So again, you've got to ask. That's the point. Right. I can, I can see it being complicated. Like I'm thinking I open up my Maps app and it's asking to set these privacy settings um, with the machine learning model. And then it's asking me for my age range, something like that. And you're like, what does that have to do with the maps app? But once you understand that it's for the machine learning model, people would have sure. yeah, more. Uh, yeah, well, that, that's provided. the idea, right? So like there's a, there's a sort of art and a science to how you expose this to, to people, right? You can't mm -hmm. just throw it in their face and expect them to understand what's going on. Like I said, you've got to give them a value proposition. You've got to say why it's going to help them to give this information. And if they decide not to, you got to be okay with that. And that's it. That's, right. that's, that's all there is to it. Right. Uh, yeah, looks like we got another question here. Don't forget to unmute yourself. So I have to do that. Can you? Oh, it's yeah. echoing. Weird. Um, so I had a question related to the. Um, yep. If you know, it's echoing pretty bad. So I tell you what, write it in the chat, and then I'll be able to answer the question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, is it echoing? Yeah, unfortunately. It's going to echo because the speaker is speaking directly. Ah, uh, no. It's, it's your computer. Can you, uh, uh, can you hear Anthony now? If I just talk like this normally? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yep. So I had a question about the... Um, Make sure I have the right word here. Uh, cognitive burden question when it came to the machine learning algorithm. Yeah. How do you? I I, I come up with like the the hypothetical issues. We talked about this in class with some aspects. What what happens if a user is being recommended products like they're being recommended products they would use or users of their of their trying to use based on personal data? Yeah. Does it leave room for the model to not recommend them other options and kind of like slot them to specific interests that might not really present the full breadth of the database? Like okay, so let me see if I can rephrase your question uh, and make sure I understand. 
So what you're saying is, okay, you got machine learning, it's going to take, you know, and the specific methodologies that we described kind of puts people into buckets, right? You're saying, well, what if the machine learning model puts you in the wrong bucket? Or what if the machine learning model doesn't have a bucket for you? Because it's missing some information that's necessary in order to figure out what the right bucket is. And so this special bucket for, you know, a particular person just doesn't exist. Well, that's a problem. And that's a limitation of machine learning. It, it, there's, there's no fix for that uh, unless you change the model. So the, the real sort of secret to this is that you can't just have like a one and done approach to your settings. So what you have to do is you have to probe these things regularly. And there's no rules on when and how often you should probe people for this information. That's an open research question. Same with how you probe people for these questions. It's not necessarily true that the best way to do it is to pop up a prompt in their face that has some, you know, text that kind of gives the basic information about what you're asking and then presents, you know, a yes or no kind of, of button. There's many, many, many different ways to do this. So, you know, I, I'm not trying to suggest by any means that my approach is like optimal or ideal in any way. In fact, it's not. And it's something that needs to be probed over time not just because of that problem where you might have missed something, but also because people's preferences change, right? Like you see something in the news and you realize like, oh my God, like, do I really want, you know, company X like getting access to my calendar now? Maybe not, you know, so then I might want to go back and update my settings, but people don't do that on their own. They don't. So, you know, part of the, part of the sort of equation here is to figure out when to ask people and check in with them too. So my question was, that's sort of there, but I had a bit more of a difference. Um, okay. So let's say group allows you to take their data for a period of time and you put them in the bucket, like the sure. bucket of interest. What happens if they say, well, I don't want to be in that bucket anymore. I want to be recommended other products outside the bucket. But the algorithm is, you know, tailored to their the interests at that period of time or before the check-in point, and they don't want to add more information, like they don't want to supply the database more data. How do you then get them out of the bucket? Well, that's an interesting question, um, but it kind of suggests, um, it suggests a few things. So telling, you know, the system, hey, I don't want to give you any more information, by the way, but I don't like this, is giving them more information. <laughs> so, like, you know, saying no is is also a signal that you can use to you know figure things out about people and there's there's nothing wrong with that right like the fact that somebody doesn't want to give you that information and so you know within my database of like training data for my machine learning model it's just blank that's still useful information right it may be and i'm not saying that this is necessarily true or that this generalizes but one interpretation of that is that maybe they're more privacy conscious right maybe they're also just you know fed up and don't want to give you more information in general, not because they're privacy conscious, but because they're overburdened, right? So either way, that's useful information that you can use. Um, and so if the machine learning model, you know, is saying, hey, like, you know, we recommend this, whether it's for your settings or a product or whatever, it doesn't really matter. You can retrain the machine learning model on new data at any given time. Right, like that's that's you know part of the system design that that uh, that surrounds that machine learning model at its core. So, you know that that's how you do that. That's that's um that's 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 not trivial, but but that's that's the approach that you can take. All right, I see. And I think that users still have a choice to overwrite the preferences. Of course, but yeah. That that's also information, right? That's 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 kind of key to what that user burden measurement was that I mentioned about my study. If the machine learning model puts you into a profile and then that profile suggests that you should pick settings A, B, C, but you don't like settings A, B, C, you want D, E, and F, that shows that the model was inaccurate. So it lowers that accuracy number a little bit. But it also means that it has to ask you, oh, okay, hang on. So you didn't want A, B, C. What do you actually want? Do you want D? Do you want E? Do you want F? So that raises the user, number of user interactions that are required. Other questions? Mike, you have a question? Yeah. So uh, sort of in line with what you were um, talking about, like I know that a common theme with uh, machine learning models is the uh, sort of black box nature of them, you put in information, it gets out information. Yep. Uh, is there anything specifically being done to 
sort of deal with the explainability of the model? Oh yeah, that is a really great question because yes, you're right. A lot of machine learning methodologies in general are not explainable at all, right? Neural networks are notorious for this because it's basically you dump in all the data, it does you know, a bunch of processing, and then you can ask it questions and it'll give you answers, but it cannot tell you how it arrived at that answer. And you know, it's still elusive figuring out how to figure all that out. But there's a reason why I used the specific methodologies that I did in my study where I didn't use neural networks. And I didn't dive too deep into the details there, but as I mentioned, I used clustering at first, which is an unsupervised machine learning method. And then after that, I used uh, decision trees, which is a supervised machine learning method. And those decision trees are how you actually organize people into profiles. And the way that a decision tree works in a nutshell is, you know, it looks at all the data and then it figures out what questions you would need to answer to go between, you know, the different options that you have along the different factors in your, you know, in, in the data to get to that final classification. And the great thing about decision trees is that underneath the hood, they are linear regression models. And I'm not going to go any more detail into that, but suffice it to say that linear regression models are a type of machine learning model that are preeminently explainable. And decision trees, it should be obvious why they're explainable, because you can actually see what decisions are necessary. You know, in other words, what answers to the questions will get you to the category that you end up in. It's literally a tree, right? So you can trace the tree. You can figure out not only how many questions somebody needs to answer to get into one of those buckets, but what questions they need to answer to get into those buckets. And based on what the questions are, you know, are you within this age range or that age range? Do you allow this kind of app to get access to your contacts or not? You know, that allows you to then determine what are the factors that influence people's bucket profile make sense absolutely yeah thank you yep any other questions yeah i had um a kind of some questions about your position like as a privacy sure. professional not necessarily at amazon but in general yeah, yeah. because we don't it's hard to figure that out when you're a student of course um yeah. so you kind of float around to different development teams within Amazon when they have a privacy kind of issue that they're working on. You're not necessarily embedded in those teams throughout the software development lifecycle of their product, right? Yep, you are correct about that. Now, um, I can't go into too much details about sort of the intricacies of that organization. You know, like, is it federated? Like, does it this way? Is it that way, right? Because that's kind of confidential information. But right. I will say in general, right? And this is not an Amazon specific thing. This is like, you know, knowledge that you can find out about any company. Many different companies do have different organizational models for how they position privacy professionals. So some companies will actually take privacy experts and embed them in software development teams. You know, they'll pick people out in the software development team and they'll say, hey, do you know anything about privacy or are you interested? And then you train them up and then they're the sort of privacy champion for that, you know, group. Right. Right. Others don't do it that way. Others have sort of like a centralized council of the elders for privacy where people come to them and ask them, you know, questions and they get answers. And others have sort of like an in between, right? Where, you know, there's different councils of the elders for like different, you know, parts of the organization, you know, say, Teams working on rockets get these, you know, go to this privacy council, but teams working on, you know, satellites go on to this privacy council and teams working on robots go to this other one, right? So there's many, many different ways to do this. Um, and I'm not going to say too, too much about how that works at Amazon in particular, but I think you can, you can probably infer, you know, to some extent based on what I've told you, kind of how I sit um, in, in Amazon generally. Cool. Thanks. Of course. Um, I, I have also one question about the preferences. So, sure. you know, that, um, with, uh, if you, you did it like your research on Android, but for example, if you are like doing IOT smart home application, yep. the preferences might be like preference of few people. You are absolutely um, correct. How do you consolidate all the different preferences or have you done anything related to that? Or was it a future work or do you yeah, think so it will be done? Well, I, I will say that I didn't personally cover that during the scope of my studies, but some of my colleagues, you know, folks that were on my thesis committee, you know, did, 
right? So, so um, Yasheng Yao, who's a good friend and colleague of mine, who's at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, you know, he's he's someone that does research into specifically this. Um, and and I will also say that Yasheng is, you know, kind of tangentially done some really cool research on using systems like Alexa to tell you about what's going on with different data practices, you know, as you're say using your fire TV and things like that. So, so yeah, like, again, that wasn't something that I personally handled, but it is a very important area um, because you're absolutely right. Like we're moving from a model where, you know, you can sort of assume things about who's using the device um, in, in the old world where people are really only using cell phones, you know, and typically you're not sharing your cell phone with others. Um, but, but in this new world of the Internet of Things where data collection and sensing and, you know, these systems are very pervasive, you know, you might be in a household where there's like 10 people using Alexa, right? So what happens then? Um, well, again, these are, these are all, you know, ongoing research areas and there aren't hard and fast solutions to this. There isn't a one size fits all approach. So, you know, for those of you who are interested in, in, you know, becoming a researcher and being on the cutting edge, these are the kinds of challenges that you can dive into. And you don't even necessarily have to work at Amazon to do it. You can do it as an academic as well. You know, Amazon does partner with academia. That's something that, you know, <laughs> Sepheda and I are actively working on as well. Um, but, you know, th this is uh, this is something that anyone can take part in. And, and I'm going to say something really inspirational and profound for just a moment here, you know, to kind of back this statement. But that is that everyone has their own intuition about what privacy is. And that's meaningful because that means that everyone has their own intuition. And so everyone has the ability to understand it from their own perspective. But the key to success is to have empathy and to try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand it from their perspective. And that is how you actually solve problems in privacy. Yeah, thank you for also the last point. Um, any other questions? Now we are almost at the end of the session and I think um, it was very informative and um, also complimentary to what I teach in class and good <laughs> that I teach software engineering and some of the students have taken software engineering also yep. so good points on how important it is to learn about software development processes yes it and, is really 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 important and you know again People use the term software engineer very flippantly, right? It typically just kind of refers to like, oh, you know, somebody who like writes code. But that's not a thing, right? Software engineering is an actual engineering practice, just like how civil engineering is, right? You don't have people who are like casual highway designers and casual bridge builders or skyscraper, you know, builders. That's, that's not a thing because we need to be able to depend on the software. It needs to be predictable and we need to be able to analyze it. And we also need to be able to do this without just building and breaking stuff, right? The, the sort of like move fast and break things phenomenon that's, uh, you know, I think a, a certain company's uh, CEO often likes to, uh, likes to say, you know, might not be a real key to success. Um, so yeah, software engineering absolutely matters. That's what my academic background is. I got into privacy because that's what I studied throughout those software engineering curricula, right? Like during undergrad, I even did research on privacy because it was something that interested me. You know, that I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you folks, undergrads in the room, you know, you can get involved in research now without having to be in a PhD program. Thank you again. Um, there are some comments on the chat that are thank you, like saying thank you to you. And I think there's no more question. Um, and um, I wish you a wonderful day. And Thanks. Uh, talk All the best to you, too. Thank yep. You. And again, my contact information is on the screen. So if you have some burning questions that you just didn't think about until later, send me an email. I'm very happy to respond. Um, you know, anything is, is on the table unless it's something that's like strictly confidential. But I'm an open book. So, you know, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And take care and all the best. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Um, any question, you guys, that are...